Good morning, everybody. We're going to get started. We're few in number, but that's okay. Hope everybody had a good weekend. We're going to start with chapter 10. Um, we may be able to get through this whole chapter in this session. If we do, then we have a decision to make about next week. So let's just see how far we get. And then at the end of class, we'll figure out what to do. But as you can see, there's 10 of us, not a strong number. So your participation will really, really help. I know it's early, believe me, I'm very aware. Didn't get much sleep last night because you know that whole baby thing. So I feel you, 8 a.m., not easy. But please, I beg you, even if it's I don't know or I don't understand or something like that, your participation really makes it easier for me to give you the best instruction. And it just makes the class go by faster because nobody just wants to sit and wait for 10 minutes while nobody responds. That ain't fun. All right. So here we go. This chapter does have some math, but it's also got some concepts. So we'll set up some concepts first. We talked about gases a little bit in chapter three when we were going over the different states of matter. We talked about gases, we talked about solids, liquids, and the properties thereof. So this should be a reminder, sort of. It should at least sound familiar. The five properties of gases that we covered that you'll need to know for this chapter as well is that gases have a variable shape and volume. And what that means is that gases will change their volume and shape according to the container that they're in. Gases expand uniformly. So if you take gas that's in a small cylinder that holds three liters and you put it into something that has 30 liters, then you're going to have those gas molecules distribute evenly. If you go in the reverse direction, you take a really big volume of gas and you smush them down, they compress uniformly too. Gases have a low density, which means that there's lots of space between particles. And when gases mix together, they mix uniformly with other gases in the same container. So one example would be if you, I ain't never gone scuba diving, probably never will in my life, terrified, but some people do it. And usually there's a mixture of oxygen and nitrogen or oxygen and helium and nitrogen or some kind of mixture of gases that includes oxygen when you go scuba diving. So in that tank, the gases are mixed uniformly. You're not gonna find a pocket of helium over here and a little bit of oxygen over there because when you're taking your breaths, you kinda need oxygen every time. So it'd be bad to just get all nitrogen or all helium, right? You need that oxygen too. So they all mix uniformly and you're getting the same thing every time you take that breath when you're doing scuba diving. So any questions here? This is kind of a, it may be jogging your memory from chapter three, but are there any questions about the properties of gases? And you can say no, or you're ready to move on, or anything like that. That helps me to know where you are. Thank you. Much appreciated. Alrighty. So I have the detailed properties here. I already kind of went through that, but I know that sometimes for the purpose of taking notes, it's nice to have something here. So I'm not gonna go through these. I'm not gonna explain them. I'm just gonna kind of flip through them to the next topic, okay? But this is here for you if you need it for your notes. Now we're going to talk specifically about pressure. So the pressure that we're talking about 
is the result of the gas molecules striking the walls of their container. So if you think about driving a car, your tires have air in them. When the pressure gets low in the tires, then they're kind of soft and you can feel that when you're driving and that's dangerous. That's a change in pressure. So maybe you have a leak or it got really cold and so the gas is, you know, compressed some and you need some, some more air. At higher temperatures, you've got the gas molecules moving around really quickly and they're striking the walls of the container more often and with greater force. So that means increased pressure. So let's write that out. If you increase the temperature, that leads to an increase in pressure. That's a relationship you will need to know. And we'll go over this relationship again. Atmospheric pressure is the result of all the air molecules in the environment pushing down on us. And I don't know if you even heard of the Weather Channel at, the, at this point. I believe it still exists. But when I was a kid, you had to turn on the TV or the radio and try to catch the local weather to know what was going on. There was no just, you know, go to the internet or pull out your phone. I mean, there was eventually, but when I was a young, young kid, it was turn on the weather channel and all oh, we missed it. So now we got to wait another 15 minutes to see what the weather's going to be. But on that weather channel, you would hear something about barometric pressure. And that, um, that unit comes from a barometer. So you can measure barometric pressure using a barometer. And it was invented by Evangelista Torricelli to measure atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure changes, you know, slight changes with the weather. So with, when it's rainy, when it's sunny, there are slight changes. One atmosphere of pressure is 29.9 .9 inches of mercury which is the same as 760 tor or one atmosphere so this is atmospheric pressure The way the barometer works is you have liquid mercury in a tank and there's a glass tube that the mercury can, you know, go up into as a result of the atmospheric pressure pushing down. So you've got all this pressure pushing down from the air and it makes the mercury go up the glass tube. You can actually read the level of the mercury and at one atmosphere it's 760 millimeters of mercury. So that's another unit for pressure. And don't worry we'll go over all of these. But that's how a barometer works. The pressure from the atmosphere pushes down on the mercury, it travels up the glass tube, and you read how many millimeters of mercury there are. Any questions about atmospheric pressure? So I, gave, I was giving you some units for pressure. The ones that you're going to need to know for the exam, which I will give you these. You don't have to memorize them. 
but atmospheres, you'll definitely need to be familiar with that. Millimeters of mercury and tor. Those are the main three that we're going to play with in our class. You can see some of the other ones in your homework, but for the purposes of the exam and chemistry in general, you're not really going to see anything outside of that. If you take physics, then you'll probably see PSI or Pascal's. But you're not going to really deal with that in this class, but it's just conversions. And we'll do some examples. Okay. So this is an example of doing a gas pressure conversion, okay? The barometric pressure is 26.2 inches of mercury. What is the barometric pressure in atmospheres? Well, what you'll need to know, and that was from that chart, is that one atmosphere is equal to 29.9 .9 inches of mercury. This is a unit equation. So chapter two has come back to haunt us again. You will need to know how to do conversions. I need a unit factor that's going to help me convert from inches of mercury to atmospheres. What unit goes on top, what unit goes on the bottom? What's my unit factor? You can just tell me what you know. You can tell me what goes in the top, what you think goes in the bottom, or what the unit factor is. We're going to put the atmospheres in the top and the inches of mercury in the bottom. That's right. So if you have question marks about that, a good place to start is what am I canceling out? Whatever that is has to go in the bottom. You may be hearing some soothing sounds from baby Hefner because he's in my arms right now and he's a little bit of a noisy sleeper. So I apologize. Or maybe you think it's cute, in which case I don't apologize. Anyway, let's do this calculation. Let me know what you get. How many atmospheres are in 26.2 inches of mercury? And I'm doing it alongside y'all. You can put your answer in the chat once you get one. Yep, that's what I got too. So with rounding, it should be 0.88 because the calculator says 0 0.876 something, something, something. And don't forget units. Oh, actually, we have three sig figs here, so it should be 0 0.876. My bad. So we do still care about sig figs here. So 
So we don't take into account the one atmosphere or the 29.9 inches of mercury because both of these are exact numbers. So how do we feel about that? That's the pressure conversion. Do you want to try another sample problem or do you want to move on? Okay. We'll do another one. So I want you to convert 850 millimeters of mercury to, um, to atmospheres. And I'll tell you that 760 millimeters of mercury is equal to one atmosphere. So you set it up the same way, it's just different units. I'll give you a minute. You could put your answer in the chat, and then we'll go over it. We can set up the equation together just in case you're stuck. We're starting with 850 millimeters of mercury. We need to write a unit factor from our unit equation. So where am I putting those millimeters of mercury? In the top or the bottom? We're putting them on the bottom. That means the one atmosphere goes on top. So for this, you're just dividing 850 by 760. And we've got two sig figs. Because again, these numbers are exact. So let me know what you get with two sig figs. Yeah, 1.1. 1 .1. So that's all it is for pressure conversions. We ready to move on? So we talked about pressure, we defined pressure, that it's just the force of the particles hitting the container that it's in, striking the walls. And we also said that when you increase the temperature, you increase the pressure because those particles are moving a lot faster. So let's talk about the other variables that can affect the pressure of a gas. So we'll cover volume, and we'll cover the number of molecules, and we'll do the recap on temperature. First, we'll talk about volume. When the volume of a gas decreases, the gas molecules are squished together. So when you decrease the volume, we're talking about compressing the gas. you've got more molecules colliding with the container more often. So you're going to increase your pressure. I like to write that with arrows because it's a little bit clearer to me what's happening. So this is the summary. If you decrease your volume you increase the pressure of your gas. 
the opposite is always is also true when the volume increases that's expansion the gas molecules now have more room to move around so they're hitting the walls of the container less often so the pressure will decrease So those are the relationships that we have with volume and pressure. If you increase one, you decrease the other. So whatever happens to one, the opposite happens to the other. Questions about that? So let's just do a quick concept check. If I have gas with an initial volume of 10 liters, and I compress that gas to a final volume of five liters, what happens to my pressure? Does the pressure increase or decrease? Yes, my pressure is going to increase because my volume decreased. Good. Now we'll recap temperature. Hold on one second. Sorry, he's a noisy little fellow. If you've ever dealt with a newborn, they are some of the noisiest creatures on God's beautiful earth. <laughs> so I apologize. Okay. We talked a little bit about temperature versus pressure. We talked about increasing the temperature and how that makes the gas molecules move around faster and collide with the container more often, so the pressure increases. And to summarize that, again, increase the temperature, you increase the pressure. If you decrease the temperature, then the particles are moving more slowly. They're gonna strike the container less often and with less force. So the pressure decreases. So let's say that I had gas at 500 degrees Celsius and I cooled it to 400 degrees Celsius. What happens to my pressure? Will my pressure increase or decrease? Exactly, it's going to decrease. So with temperature, whatever happens to the temperature, the same thing happens to the pressure. There's a direct relationship here. We've got one more variable, and that's the number of molecules of gas versus the pressure. So when you have the number of molecules decrease, then you've got fewer gas molecules colliding with the walls. So the pressure is going to decrease too. And the number of molecules, we're gonna use N for that. So 
So if you decrease n, then you will also decrease the pressure. If you increase the number of gas molecules and keep everything else constant, right, so the volume isn't changing or anything like that, then you've got more molecules banging around in that container, which means your pressure is going to increase. So let's say that I had 1.5 moles of gas, and I add another 0.75 moles of gas. What happens to my pressure if the temperature and the volume of the container are held constant? Does my pressure increase or decrease? Remember that moles is just talking about a certain number of molecules, right? So if I'm starting with 1.5 moles of gas and I'm adding some more gas to it, am I increasing N or decreasing N? You're increasing it. So if I increase N, the number of molecules, then that means my pressure is also going to increase. Does that make sense? Are we good here? And thank you for your participation. It makes things go so much more smoothly. Because I'm telling you, last night sleep? No. Did not happen. So we are running on fumes and the grace of God right now. <laughs> so thank you for dealing with me and whatever crazy I may have. Thank you for your participation. So we've talked about what gases are in terms of their properties. We've covered pressure, talked about the units, how to convert from one unit to another, and the different ways that pressure can be affected by volume, temperature, and the number of molecules. Now we're gonna talk about those relationships in terms of the different laws, the gas laws, that govern them. So there are experiments that were done that determined all the relationships that we just went over. The first one that we're gonna cover is Boyle's Law. And he did, so Robert Boyle did an experiment using a J-tube in liquid mercury. And he did an experiment to look at how the volume of air was affected by the by the pressure of the mercury okay so this is a j tube it's shaped like a j right so if you put some liquid mercury in here you're going to have air trapped here and you're going to have air kind of coming in from the top that's your atmospheric pressure. So kind of like how with the barometer, we had an open container of liquid mercury and pressure pushing down. If you just put a little bit of mercury in this J-tube, you're going to trap air, and you're going to have atmospheric pressure pushing down on this mercury. As he added more mercury to the tube, so going from this level here to this level here he had a decrease in the volume of air so that was how he discovered this indirect relationship between pressure and volume and that led him to write 
a law. And Boyle's law states that the volume of a gas is inversely proportional to the pressure at constant temperature. And the equation for that is P1V1 equals P2V2. The P1V1, that's talking about the initial conditions of the gas. So it's initial pressure and it's initial volume. P2V2 is talking about the final conditions. And it'll become clear why this is important when we start solving problems with these equations. The graph on the right is just a depiction of the inverse relationship between pressure and volume. So at high pressures, you've got low volume. At low pressures, you've got high volume. Questions? Because the next step is to try some try a problem. So let me know if this is good. All right. Cool, thank you. So let's try a problem. What I'm gonna do here is what we'll do for every gas law problem. Just like in chapter nine with stoichiometry, where you have to pick out the pieces and figure out what information you have so you can identify the problem type you're dealing with, we have to do the same thing with the gas law questions because you're not gonna have a heading that says Boyle's law problem to tell you you have to use Boyle's law. You have to read the problem and see what information you're given, what the question is asking, and then figure out which gas law to use to get you there. So let's pretend like it doesn't say Boyle's law problem at, at the top. And we're just reading the problem as it is. A 3.50 liter sample of methane gas exerts a pressure of 1550 millimeters of mercury. What is the final pressure if the volume changes to seven liters. What I always do is I go through and write out each number and label it. So we've got 3.50 liters, 1550 millimeters of mercury, and we've got seven liters. looks like we've got pressures and volumes. These are our initial conditions. So I will label that initial volume V1 and the initial pressure P1. These variables, you're gonna see them throughout the gas laws. So you can label them like this. And then the question is asking about the final pressure, which we don't have. And we have a final volume. So as you lay all of these things out, you can see, okay, I've got pressures and, t pressures and volumes. That means I need to use Boyle's Law. And again, that's what Boyle's Law is. P1V1 equals P2V2. Does everybody follow how I got there? from writing out all the different variables and then figuring out the law. That's the process I want you to use for each problem. So let me know if that makes sense. So if you don't do this part, then there's a good probability that you might get it wrong because you might pull the wrong gas law. So don't just jump to the gun and start writing equations and putting things in your calculator. 
see what you have first. Now we need to see what is it that we're solving for. We're solving for the final pressure, which is P2. We need to rearrange this equation so that we've got P2 on one side and everything else on the other side. Take a second and try to do that in your notebook. Try to isolate P2. I'll do it in just a second, but I want you to have a chance to do it and brush off the algebra a little bit if you aren't taking math this semester. Make sure that we don't have any problems. So you don't need to put your answer in the chat, but just give it a shot, even if you just mentally say, oh, okay, I know how to do this. Do that. I'll give you one minute, and then I'll keep going. Okay, I'm going to write out how we get there. To solve for P2, you need to divide both sides by V2. When you do that, you'll have P2 on one side and everything else on the other side. Notice how I've grouped together the volumes. You always want to do that when you're doing these types of problems. So if you're dividing by V2, you should group together your volumes, so V1 over V2. It'll become apparent a little bit later why that's helpful. But is everybody okay with solving this equation for P2? You can be honest if it's not okay. That's really all right. But does everybody understand? Okay. All right. So can you give me a little bit more about what doesn't make sense, Cameron? If we divide by V2, we're getting rid of V2 on one side. And then we have this equation on the other side. All I did was pull out the P1 and have V1 over V2. So we're still doing the division like we're supposed to. Just rewrote it a little bit differently. Okay. So we've got our equation. Now we need to put some numbers in here. Our P1 is 1,550 millimeters of mercury. V1 is 3.50 liters. And V2 is 7.00 liters. Before we even do the math, let's just think about the concept. We're starting with 3.5 liters. We're ending with 7 liters. What's happening to our volume here if we're going from 3.5 to 7? Did we increase our volume or decrease our volume? We increased our volume. We were talking about how volume affects pressure. So if we increase the volume, what do we expect to happen to our pressure? Will it increase or decrease?
our pressure should decrease. That's right. So when we do this calculation, we should get a number that's less than our initial pressure. Now I want you to put it into your calculator and let me know what you get. We need three significant figures here. Camden already had it locked and loaded. She was like, I'm waiting for you to ask me what the answer is. Really appreciate it. We have a number here, but what are the units? Millimeters of mercury, that's right. So when you group together your like terms, your volumes, your pressures, temperatures, it becomes much more clear what unit your answer is. So it's pressure. It should be some kind of pressure unit. So millimeters of mercury, um, atmosphere, whatever. Whatever pressure you use, whatever units the initial pressure is in, that's what your final answer is going to be in. So if you're given millimeters of mercury and you use this equation, your P2 is going to be in millimeters of mercury. Unless the problem asks for a specific unit, we're done. How do we feel about that one? Does anybody want to try another one? I would literally just give you some different numbers and we could do it again. Okay. Let's say we reversed it. We started with seven liters and we end with 3.5 liters. I'll give you a couple of minutes to go through and rewrite it and let me know what your answer is in the chat. If you get stuck, you can let me know that too. Looks like we have an answer. And that looks like what I got too. I'll write out the equation. So the difference here would be that the 7 is on top and the 3.5 liters is on the bottom. Now for this problem, we need three significant figures. And to get that, we'd have to write it in scientific notation but I'm not going to be that tricky for you. But that's just a reminder that we have a final exam coming up and you will need to remember how to do that. So are we good on this one? This is all Boyle's Law is, pressures and volumes. then let's move on. That was pressure and volume. Now we will cover volume and temperature. And that's Charles's law. He discovered 
that the volume of a gas is directly proportional to the temperature of the gas in Kelvin. Cannot stress that enough. You have to use Kelvin. So you, maybe you don't remember, but in chapter two, we did temperature conversions between Fahrenheit and Celsius, Celsius and Kelvin, and all everything in between. So you'll need to remember that. So you may wanna jot this down. If you're trying to get to Kelvin from degrees Celsius, you take the degrees Celsius and add 273. If you're trying to go from the Kelvin temperature to Celsius, you take that Kelvin temperature and subtract 273. Do not use Celsius in these gas law equations because it will not work out. It has to be the Kelvin temperature. All right. So this is just an illustration of Charles's law. If you have a balloon just have room temperature, and then you cool it with liquid nitrogen, which you literally can just drip some on there, the volume of the balloon will decrease. The balloon will also get kind of crispy. <laughs> but those gas molecules are slowing down. They're not colliding with the, the walls of the balloon as frequently or with as much force. So the volume of the balloon is going to shrink. Now I'll go through a sample problem for how to use Charles's law, which again, I'll put up here. When you're reading through these gas law problems, Anytime you see a problem that's all volumes and temperatures, you know that you're dealing with Charles's law. 132 liter helium balloon is heated from 20 degrees Celsius to 40 degrees Celsius. What's the final volume at constant pressure? Well, let's write down what we've got. We've got a volume and a temperature And these are our initial conditions. The balloon is heated from 20 degrees Celsius to 40 degrees Celsius. So that must mean 40 degrees Celsius is our final temperature. The question is asking what's the final volume? Well, we don't know. But if all we have is volumes and temperatures, we have to use Charles's law. Before you can use this proportion, you will need to cross multiply. So that means you're multiplying V1 times T2 and V2 times T1. Once you have that, you can isolate your variable and solve just like we did with Boyle's law. This time we're looking for V2. I want you to try to rearrange the equation for V2 and then we'll solve. Don't forget to convert this to Kelvin. 
but I want you to try to solve this problem. I'll give you two minutes just to see how far you get, and then I will jump in and start solving it. Alrighty, so I'm going to jump in here and start solving. Just like before with Boyle's Law, where we just have to divide on both sides, it's the same thing here. You divide by T1 on both sides. When you rewrite this, you're going to have V2 on one side. Everything else on the other. Before we fill in our numbers, we need to convert these temperatures to Kelvin. So you take 20 degrees Celsius, you add 273, and you get 293. You do the same thing with the 40. So 273 plus 40 should give you 313 Kelvin. Now we can fill everything in. Before we do the math, let's think about what's happening here. We're starting at 20 degrees Celsius and we're going to 40 degrees Celsius. What's happening to our temperature, increase or decrease? It's an increase. So what do we think is gonna happen to our pressure? Or excuse me, our volume. The pressure, I keep saying pressure, the temperature and the volume are directly related. So whatever happens to the temperature, the same thing is going to happen to the volume. So we should see an increase in volume. Yeah, when you do the math... you should get 141 liters. So those should always match. It's okay. But they should always match your idea of what's happening and then when you do the numbers. So the temperature increases, that means we should see a volume increase. And we did. Our initial volume was 132 liters. When you do the math, you get 141 liters as the final volume. Does this make sense using Charles's law? We can do another example, but I just want to know how we're doing with this so far. Does anyone need anything re-explained? Does the math make sense? Let me know how you're doing. Okay, we can do another example, and I'll write up here again how to convert to Kelvin. 
So if you want Kelvin, you take your degree Celsius and add 273. So let's just change some numbers around. So let's say we have the same volume, but our temperature change is cooling. So we've cooled it from 45 degrees Celsius to 25 degrees Celsius. Go ahead and give that a shot. I'll give you two minutes. You can put your answer in the chat if you get one or you can hang on and wait. Always you can let me know that you're stuck or you don't understand something. Or if it's a quick, how do I convert again? You can throw that in the chat and I'll give you an answer so you can keep going. All right, two minutes and then I'll check back in. All right, so I'm gonna write out the temperatures and then I'll write out the equation. So those are the Kelvin temperatures for T1 and T2. We go ahead and plug in our numbers. T2 goes on top. T1 is on the bottom. Now since we're cooling, we're decreasing the temperature, right? That means that we should be decreasing our volume too. When you go through and do the math, you should get 124 liters when you take into account sig figs. Your calculator would say something like 123.698. How did we do on that one? Did we get it? Questions? Good. Yeah, the gas laws are kind of a, a relief. Chapter nine is usually the the source of a lot of anxiety because stoichiometry is perceived to be difficult. But chapter 10, coming after that, it's easy. So let's move on. We'll go through one more gas law and then we'll take a break. The last one we'll cover before our break is Gay-Lussac's law. So he looked at pressure and temperature. And it's the same kind of relationship, again, where the temperature is in Kelvin. Let me switch back to my black here. So if you have a, t a pressure that increases your temperature will also increase. And we already covered that. If you decrease the temperature, you decrease the pressure. So it's the same thing. We use it the same way that we do um, Charles's law, where you have to cross multiply first. That should always be your first step.
from here you can solve for whatever variable you need. So let's try a problem. Again, I'll write up here so that we don't forget. how to convert to Kelvin. And that's Gay-Lussac's law. We've got a steel container of nitrous oxide at 10.4 atmospheres. And it's cooled from 33 degrees Celsius to negative 28 degrees Celsius. What is the final volume at, at constant eh, it should say, what is the final pressure at constant volume? The first step should always be writing out what you have. We have an initial pressure and an initial temperature And that is changed to negative 28 degrees Celsius, which is our T2. The final pressure we do not know. Whenever you see pressures and temperatures, that's Gay-Lussac's law. Starting here, where I've already done the cross multiplication, and you need to solve for P2, I want you to try this problem because it is very similar to what we just did with Charles's Law. I'll give you a couple of minutes just to get started writing everything out, and then I'll jump in and write it down. If you want to, we'll do another problem, and then we'll take a break. So two minutes, and I'll check back in. Alrighty, I'm going to get started solving here. We have to divide both sides of this equation by T1. When you do that, you get P2 on one side, and then everything else on the other. That break might have to come a little bit sooner, y'all. We'll try to get through this one. So this is what you should get for your equation to use. Before you start filling in numbers, you have to convert your temperatures. So 33 degrees Celsius is 306 Kelvin. Negative 28 degrees Celsius is 245. Now we can fill in our numbers. Before we do the math, what do we expect? The temperature is cooled. So that means a decrease. Gay-Lussac's law, we're looking at pressure and temperature, and they're directly related. So should our pressure increase or decrease?
it should decrease. The same thing that happens to the temperature happens to the pressure. And the math suggests the same thing. So we decrease the pressure to 8.33 atmospheres. Questions on this one? All right, then let's just change around some numbers. Let's say that we heated our gas from negative 5.5 .5 degrees Celsius to 15 degrees Celsius. I'll write it over here too just for so you can see it. We'll keep the pressure the same but instead we're heating our gas. I'll give you another couple of minutes and then we'll go over it. I'll start by writing out the temperatures. This time we're heating our gas, so that means a temperature increase and a pressure increase. And the math says the same thing. How do we do here? If you didn't get to an answer quite yet, that's okay, but did you at least get to set up the problem? Are there any questions? Let me know how you're doing. is cricket, so I'm guessing no questions. All right. So we're going to pause here and take a break. We'll break until 940. All right, guys, it's 940. I just want to thank you again for dealing with me, accommodating me, I should say. It's a nicer way to put it. Really appreciate the participation and everything, too. So where we left off, we talked about gases and their properties, pressure and what affects pressure. We talked about the different gas laws, Boyle's law, Charles's law, 
Gay-Lussac's law. Now we're going to combine those three laws for the combined gas law. And this is what it looks like. P1V1 over T1 is equal to P2V2 over T2. To use this, just like with Charles's law and Gay-Lussac's law, cross multiply first. Then, you can solve for whatever variable you need to. If you're still with me, if you're back from break, let me know. Hopefully, I'm not just talking to myself. We're just going to press forward, I guess. So let's talk about using the combined gas law to solve for things. Let's say that we wanted to solve for V2. Like we said, you have to cross multiply first. And I apologize. I'm going to need to pause here for a second. Give me one more second. Okay, sorry about that. Baby is less than a week old. He eats very, very frequently. So thank you for accommodating me in my special circumstances. I really appreciate it. Before baby Hefner got hungry, we were talking about the combined gas law. This is the combined gas law. You will need to solve for variables, just like with all the other gas laws. The first thing you have to do is cross multiply, which is what I was doing. And then you isolate whichever variable you need. So if we're solving for V2, then we need to divide both sides by P2 and T1. When you rewrite this, Again, you're going to want to group together the things that are similar. So we've got pressures, P1 over P2. We've got temperatures, T2 over T1. And then we have a volume. Then it becomes very apparent what your units are going to be. You're solving for a volume, and all the units for pressure cancel, the units for temperature cancel, and you need to figure out that volume. So whatever units your volume are in for V1, that's what V2 is in. So make sure all pressures have the same units. So if P1 is an atmosphere, make sure that P2 is also in atmospheres. Same thing for volume. If you have a volume in liters, then make sure that both V1 and V2 are in liters. And I'll show you why that matters when solving for, v, for T2. Starting with the product of the cross multiplication, we're looking for T2. 
two. You divide both sides by P1, V1. And you make sure you keep your pressures together, your volumes together, and then temperature is left out. Again, make sure that all of the volumes have the same units, liters or milliliters. Doesn't matter which one, as long as they're the same. So let me know if you're still with me. Again, thank you for dealing with me with the additional break. But does this make sense for solving for variables with the combined gas law? Okay. Let's try a problem. So with the gas, the combined gas law problems, you'll see pressure, temperature, and volume. So you have a 10 liter sample of carbon dioxide gas at 300 Kelvin and one atmosphere. If the volume and Kelvin temperature double, what is the new pressure? So we're just adding on variables here. Always start with writing down what you have. The initial temperatures, pressures, volumes, you give those P1, V1, T1. So we've got a 10 liter sample, that's V1. 300 Kelvin, that's T1. And our pressure, of one atmosphere is P1. If the volume and Kelvin temperature double, well double 10 is 20 liters, and 2 times 300 Kelvin is 600 Kelvin, what is the new pressure? Again, we've got pressure, temperature, and volume, so this has to be the combined gas law. Cross multiply. and then isolate your variable. This time we're looking for P2. I'll give you a couple of minutes. I want you to try to isolate P2 and then solve for what it is. I'll check back in in two minutes. All right. When you rearrange and solve for P2, that means that you have to divide both sides by V2 and T1. So that's what you should get when you solve for P2. Again, grouping the volumes together and the temperatures together. Then we just need to plug in the numbers. Our initial pressure is one atmosphere.
our initial volume is 10 liters. Final volume is 20. T2 is 600 Kelvin and T1 is 300. If you didn't get an answer or you got stuck with solving, you can try putting this into your calculator and put it into the chat what you get. And if you're looking at your calculator like, um, what? The pressure remains the same. So P2 is still one atmosphere. You're increasing the temperature and you're also increasing the pressure by the same, fa or increasing the, the volume by the same factors. So, your pressure is not going to change. Questions on this? I'm going to take that as a no. We'll do some more practice on the combined gas law next week. Okay. We'll get through some more concepts and then we'll wrap up. The first concept that we'll cover is vapor pressure. So vapor pressure is exerted by the vapor that is above a liquid so whenever you have a liquid just sitting there, at every temperature there's a certain amount of vapor that forms. And if you have a closed container, that vapor is trapped and it exerts a pressure on the liquid. The vapor pressure increases as temperature increases. And that shouldn't be a surprise because vapor pressure is just pressure and pressure increases when temperature increases. If we have a number of different things in solution, then there's going to be pressures from each of those liquids that are combined. Same thing if we have a mixture of gases. So the pressure, the total pressure, is going to be equal to the partial pressure from each gas in the mixture. We talked about scuba diving earlier where I said that there's usually a mixture of gas like oxygen and nitrogen or oxygen, nitrogen, and helium. The total pressure of the tank would be the pressure of the helium plus the oxygen plus the nitrogen. The pressure exerted by each gas is a partial pressure. So let's write that out. Our example is scuba diving. And if we had three gases in the tank, the pressure from the oxygen plus the pressure from the nitrogen plus the pressure of the helium would equal the total pressure in the tank. So let's do a quick practice problem. A noble gas, a sample of noble gases contains helium, neon, argon and krypton. If the partial pressure of helium 
is 125 millimeters of mercury, neon is 45, argon is 158, and krypton is 17. What's the total pressure of the sample? Well, the total pressure is going to be the sum of all of those partial pressures. So we have helium plus the neon plus the argon plus krypton. Make sure that all of the partial pressures are in the same units. Here, everything is in millimeters of mercury, so we're good to go. If you're still with me and you have your calculator, Throw it in your calculator and see what you get. Yep, that's what I got too. And we'll do some practice with partial pressure next week um, in terms of what if you don't have the same units. We'll be combining the idea of doing the pressure unit conversion and partial pressures. But this is just a quick, you know, make sure you get the partial pressures that you add them together for the total pressure. And it seems like we're good on that. So I'm going to move forward. One of the techniques that's used in the lab is to collect a gas over water. That's just using displacement and then you can trap the gas and do something else with it. That gas that you collect is wet gas because it contains water vapor. So in this example where we're collecting hydrogen gas over here, the total pressure is equal to the pressure of the hydrogen gas plus the partial pressure from the water at that given temperature. This chart tells you what the partial pressure of water is at every temperature in five degree increments from five degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius. You do not need to memorize this. You'll be provided with this chart so you can reference it for the exam. But I would definitely print it out or kind of bookmark it or something and have it available when you're doing your homework because you'll need it. Again, each temperature of water has a different partial pressure. So please take note. Also this is in millimeters of mercury. If your problem is in atmosphere or anything else, you'll need to convert. So this summarizes what I said before. We can determine the pressure of the hydrogen gas as long as we know the total pressure and the pressure from the water at that temperature. So here's an example. We've got a sample of hydrogen gas that was collected over 20 degrees Celsius water. The, atmosphere, the atmospheric pressure is 755 millimeters of mercury. What is the pressure exerted by the hydrogen gas in the cylinder? Our total pressure 
is the atmospheric pressure in this case which is 755 millimeters of mercury. That contains the partial pressure of hydrogen plus the partial pressure of water. I'm going to go back to that chart and show you how to use it. It's just too big to fit. So we're at 20 degrees. So you find the value at 20 degrees Celsius and it's 17.5 millimeters of mercury for the water pressure. So we can fill that in. How would you figure out the partial pressure for hydrogen? Add, subtract, multiply, divide. What do you need to do? You have to subtract. What does your calculator say if you subtract 17.5 from 755? This is what your calculator is going to say. But remember the rules for adding and subtracting sig figs. We only have up until the ones place for that atmospheric pressure. So our answer from the calculator we have to round to three significant figures. So it's 738 millimeters of mercury here. Again, sig figs are back adding and subtracting rules are back. So refresh yourself from chapter two, or no, that's the prerequisite science skills, excuse me. So the very first lecture that we did, and that'll help you in studying for the, the final exam as well. So that's collecting a gas over water and using the idea of vapor pressure and partial pressures to solve. Any questions here? And again, thank you for your participation. Thank you for hanging in there with me. If there are no questions, we'll move forward. All righty. So I think we'll go over this and then we'll call it here. We started off talking about the properties of gases. That the particles are far apart, they move really fast and randomly and things like that. Now we're going to talk about the kinetic molecular theory of gases. And you'll see a little bit of overlap, but this is talking about why gases act the way they do. Okay. 
So we know that gases are made up of tiny molecules. Duh, right? Those gas molecules move around very, very quickly. And they move in straight lines and travel kind of in random directions. Gas molecules have no attraction for one another. So they aren't drawn together. That also means that they don't repel each other either. So if they do interact with each other, they just kind of bounce off of each other. They don't stick together. They don't, there's nothing that happens to them to make them interact and change their course of mo motion other than to just bounce off of each other. When the molecules collide, they don't lose any energy. They just bounce off of each other. And the average kinetic energy of a gas molecule is proportional to the Kelvin temperature. So what that means is when we say that something has a Kelvin temperature of 300 Kelvin, each particle of gas in that container on average has kinetic energy that is the equivalent of 300 Kelvin. And there's a calculation that you can do, which we don't, we're not going to do, that you can calculate kinetic energy based on temperature. So that's why we have to use the Kelvin temperature, not Celsius, because the kinetic energy of the gas is directly related to the Kelvin temperature through an equation that we're not going to go over. You'll need to know these um, bullet points and understand them and be able to answer questions about them. So, you know, which one of these d is not part of the kinetic molecular theory or, you know, gases have no attraction, some attraction, that kind of question, like a multiple choice question on these. I'll have some of those for you next week. Okay. So we're going to stop here because we won't have time to finish everything. We're very close. So we'll finish up the last few slides next week. You do have Mastering Chemistry for this chapter, Chapter 10, and it's due on Sunday, November 22nd. So it's the Sunday before Thanksgiving. There's no chapter check-in. I also want to remind you that you have a final exam. So there's no exam five. It's just a final exam that will be December 7th from 8 to 10. So it'll be kind of like a chapter 9 and 10 test. Plus, we'll go over some of the, the stuff from all the previous chapters. And that will be your final exam. There will be a chapter 10 video for YouTube. Um, I just obviously didn't have a chance to do that yet. But don't worry, it is forthcoming. So you'll have that to help you along. And then we'll finish up the live lectures next week. You can bring any questions that you have. Um, we have office hours this week. So if you've got questions on Chapter 9 homework, you can bring those as well. That's all I have for you. If you have any questions, this is a good time. Otherwise, you're free to go.